Thank you. Uh, thank you for the welcome and the introduction, Monica, also for initiating and, and organizing this event together with uh, Jorges, Fernando, everyone else at the Angewandte. And uh, thank you for all those who joined the, um, um, the, the imagining organization, uh, uh, sorry, the organizational art workshop that we gave this, uh, this, that I gave this afternoon, or well, that we did all together. Um, with some great outcomes, I would actually love to debate these outcomes, but that's not what this, what this lecture is, uh, is, uh, is for. Um, so, uh, and to those participants of this afternoon, a few parts of the things I will say now overlap mildly, but uh, please be, be patient with me. Um, the title of my talk is Imagining Organization, and this relates to what Monica already, already mentioned, the practice that I term organizational art, the creation of artworks in the form of alternative organizations, alternative organizations that um, hopefully are capable to, to, to provoke a way that we can, that we can confront uh, rising authoritarianism, uh, global precarity, climate catastrophe. But before going into examples of such organizational artwork, I just wanted to take uh, a moment to maybe say something about where I come from, from as an artist. Because I realized lately that uh, when I talk about my work, I talk about what I do now and, um, uh, and especially thinking back of my time as a student or a first years of artistic practice, of course, the conditions are so different. There's a, there's a trajectory that leads from one thing to another. So to say something about myself, I would say um, I come from um, a background that I would describe as a form of violent education. And this very much informs my interest in institutions and the way that institutions can replicate certain um, oppressive uh, mechanisms of power. In my case, it led me to be a very early high school dropout to do a lot of factory works before I was uh, accepted uh, by exemption uh, by the art school. And once graduated, I went to live in uh, Rotterdam, a city in the Netherlands, port city of the Netherlands. I lived in the south park, south part of the, not in south park, in the south part of <laughs> Rotterdam, um, where, uh, where in order to secure my living, I was a caretaker for elderly and disabled people um, by day, and I was an artist at night. I will, it sounds a bit Batman-ish, but it's, I will, I will, <laughs> I will uh, uh, the lowbrow version of it. Uh, I, will, I will come back to that in a moment. This time that I came to live in Rotterdam, it was around 2004. It was a few years after, you could very much say, meteoric rise of a far-right politician called Pim Fortuyn, uh, he had been murdered, was murdered by an animal rights activist in 2001. In 2004, the year I came to live in the city, it was far-right filmmaker and artist Theo van Gogh, Theo van Gogh, who was killed by a religious fundamentalist. And in, in my city, in Rotterdam, Port City, um, a majority of our citizens have a, have a migrant background. And there was a real palpable tension around this, the rise of the far-right, uh, these, these public murders having, uh, having taken place. And I wanted to address this through my work, which I did mainly at night uh, on the streets, uh, on the streets of, uh, of my city. I made works like these called uh, Dutch Flags, which was a series, you could say, a series of street drawings. So they were drawings of, uh, made with flags, with Dutch flags, uh, suggesting the kind of ghostly um, the ghostly remainders of secretive nationalist gatherings. And it was a way of, of trying to make visible the, the ghostly support of the far right. Because in election polls, I don't know if it, uh, if it has been similar here in, in, in Austria or the different countries where you're from, um, in, in election polls, it never showed that the far right was going to win. You know, they were always polling low, low, low until election day and then suddenly with and, and shock, everyone was shocked, it was somehow. So, to, so I was trying to, to try to find a, a visual language that could, that could grasp this ghostly presence of the far right electorate. Other works I made was the replacement of uh, street signs. Um, I replaced street signs that were originally in Dutch in uh, uh, neighborhoods where the majority language was a different one. In this case, uh, the majority language being uh, Arabic. Of course, this addressed was a way to, to, to play into the 
dominant language of the far right that always suggests this kind of uh, secret plot for a great, great replacement. Uh, mass migration will replace our identity, will replace our population. On the other hand, there's another neighborhood in this, in, in this, this was in The Hague, in the city of The Hague, where there's a, a majority uh, Chinese Dutch citizens and they do have Chinese uh, name signs. This would never happen in the case uh, of, of Arabic. So it was also a way of confronting the very different um, policy frameworks with which uh, migrant communities in, our, in my country were being um, uh, treated. Other works uh, like these, the uh, placement of uh, car bomb wreckages, well, wreckages that were modeled after images of uh, car bombs at the time the Netherlands was participating in the illegal wars in Afghanistan in, and Iraq. Uh, and I felt there was a continuous discrepancy between uh, us being a country that was supporting this war, but never feeling like we were at war. So uh, th there was a kind of um, a sense of alienation uh, between being a country at war without any resonance from the war back. So I began to reconstruct car bomb wreckages from uh, Im media images uh, in Iraq and place them at night in the city trying to give a kind of feedback to this media uh, reality, to give it a material presence in the city. In other works, I uh, flew planes uh, above different city centers um, that declared two slogans, be free, but as a kind of dictum, as a kind of obligation, be free or else. And it was, it was an attempt to challenge this uh, construction of um, freedom that is propagated by both neoliberals and the far right alike. And that it's a, it's a, it's a notion of freedom and doctrinal notion of freedom that at essence is always about taking the freedom of someone else. It is never an emancipatory freedom. It's a freedom that is actually a threat. It's be free, be free as in assimilate according to whatever this dominant national culture is supposed to be. Be free or else, be free or else, forced deportation, be free or else, structural, uh, structural mistreatment by the police, be free or else, uh, invasion. This was uh, also still in the aftermath of uh, the, the wars in, uh, in Iraq and, uh, and Afghanistan. The most controversial uh, project by far from this early series of, uh, of interventionist artworks, you could say, was called the Geert Wilders Works. It's a piece from 2005 which was a series of improvised memorials with depiction of the far-right politician Geert Wilders, that you can see here, of the PVV party, which translates as Freedom Party. It's exactly the, literally the same uh, name of the FPÖ here in, uh, in Austria. And the type of white supremacist freedom the politician, the white supremacist freedom of, that Wilders propagated, the Wilders that, that you see on the pictures here, um, consisted of, I mean, Actual proposals that this political party have, have done the last 15 years are, amongst others, um, that uh, Moroccan Dutch youth that engage in petty, petty crime should be shot through the kneecaps. Uh, that, um, there, that there should be a Guantanamo Bay modeled prison in the Netherlands uh, for, for, for uh, Dutch uh, people with, uh, with a migrant background. Um, the banning of the Quran, the closing of um, mosques, the preemptive bombing of Iran. Like, I mean, by now this has almost become a kind of firebrand copy of agendas from, from Orbán's Hungary uh, to, the, to the FBO here, to, to the Freedom Party in the Netherlands. But it, it doesn't make it less shocking um, and, and offensive. So, um, as a result of of Wilders, this person threatening Dutch communities of immigrant origins, he himself is being threatened as well. It tends to happen if you use, if you make legislative proposal that threaten mass, large parts of your population with deportation, you might get a threat back. And he uses this very effectively in his campaigns. He walks around publicly with a bullet, bulletproof uh, vest, trying to present himself as a kind of martyr for democratic freedoms. Like, I'm being threatened the way our entire society is threatened. He kind of tries to embody this idea of Dutch national culture. But paradoxically, he's a martyr that never dies. Like, hey, he sacrifices himself, but he never disappears. He keeps, keeps on existing. He's a kind of zombie-like political figure, you could say. And that was what I tried to depict through this uh, series of memorial installations that I made um, anonymously in different locations throughout the Netherlands. This image is actually 
the entire project is documented by the police. Uh, this is a page from the police file that was built uh, as a result of these works um, emerging in the, in the public space. So media picked up on the works. Um, Wilders reported to the police that he felt threatened by the artworks. The police were not so certain. They made public statements saying, we're not sure. Maybe someone is threatening you, threatening you. Maybe someone is celebrating you. Like maybe these are, yeah, these are kind of like a strange, like a, a religious uh, fetishistic type of, of support for your, for your policies. Um, and after about a month of speculation, I announced I was the artist about, uh, uh, behind the work. I was immediately arrested and jailed. This is the, a page from the, from the police file. It's part of the documentation of the artwork. Um, and what followed was three years of court cases that Wilders waged um, against me. Now, I quickly realized these legal proceedings are very much part of the work. Like, the artworks provoked these court cases, and the court, the court is a very theatrical setting. It's a performative arena, a place where very different claims to reality are put into confrontation with one another. Um, and I was not able to, we're not allowed to photograph in the court, so I had to hire another artist, which is also interesting, a court artist, to document the artist in the court. Now, this was 2005, eh? so this, this is like 17 years ago, and this is how I look like in this picture. Like, very guilty and very old. Uh, but it's also interesting, because I realized that's a strange power that court artists have. Like, we never know who these people are, really. They're not, like, publicly known artists. But they are the ones who depict you as a... As a, as a potentially guilty person or a prosecuted person in the larger, in the larger media. So I, I suddenly discovered a very strange political power that, um, court artists, um, that court artists have. So in this case, the courts, this, this performative arena, um, was a place where you could say that different, different claims to truth came into confrontation. Uh, Wilders claims, this is not an artwork, but a threat to my life. I claimed uh, the artwork is a very real depiction of the emergence of a new far-right culture of martyrdom. The law lays a claim to truth as a supposed neutral arbiter in the process. So this brought me to uh, also announce the works to send public invitations for the public to join, to hire the court artist. I wrote my own defenses in the form of manifestos that the Nas uh, National Dutch newspaper um, publish published. And I won uh, the case uh, against Wilders, um, but it only turned out to be the beginning of a longer research to deconstruct and challenge the emerging politics and mythologies and symbols of the far right in the Netherlands. In uh, 2010, only a few years after the court case uh, ended, Wilders' Freedom Party actually entered into, into government. And at that time, their platform was no longer only focused on uh, immigrants and people of Islamic faith. He was more and more um, concerned with uh, the threat of contemporary artists. Uh, maybe, maybe I had a role to play in that process, uh, this I'm not entirely sure. Um, but in his program, he, they became, the, the party started to frame artists more and more as a kind of embodiment of a degenerate, multicultural, left-wing culture, very much this kind of and a reiteration of the Antarctica Kunst. Now, today, uh, many of the far right uh, parties call it cultural Marxism. Surprisingly, though, in the process, I found out that the number two of the Freedom Party, of Wilders, uh, of Wilders platform, uh, Fleur Agema, had herself been an art student. And not only had she been an art student, we actually attended the same art school at more or less the same period of time. So I went back to the archives of our art school to find out, like, what exactly had Agema done as, a, as an artist? What could her art tell me about the role of, of the rise of the, of the, about her role in the rise of the, of the far right? And in our library, I found Agema's uh, thesis. It was a, it's a 366 page uh, document that is called Closed Architecture. And it consists of her graduation uh, project, which is um, a proposal, a very detailed proposal for an alternative prison model. So, um, I mean, somewhere also, I often feel, you know, there's this struggle to, uh, we struggle to imagine alternative futures, and sometimes I feel we also struggle to imagine how bad our situation really is, like how absurd 
uh, and perverse that in this case what does the artist that later joins the far right party what is it that she developed as an artist a prison model like of course but somehow I couldn't have imagined it if you would have asked me before uh, so I, I assembled um, a team of architects to to analyze um, this uh, this prison model which essentially consists of a, a four phased prison prison model that follows an almost game-like logic in which prisoners have to move from one uh, compound to the next. Here you have a drawing of, uh, of, Achema's, uh, of Achema herself. And the idea is that in her model, prisoners would not be sentenced to a specific period of detention, like you are imprisoned for two and a half years or whatever, but to a specific level of the prison. So for example, for phase one, which she calls the bunker, um, uh, it's like this very isolated, super minimalist, uh, very sober, almost kind of cartoonesque image of a prison. This is the 3D model reconstruction that we, uh, that we made. They stay there in maximum isolation, but if the prisoner uh, reaches certain learning objectives, it's unclear what these learning objectives are, but if they reach certain learning objectives, they move forward into the prison or backward into the prison. So essentially, the prisoner is tasked to liberate themselves. Like, depending on your behavior, you might get out faster or never. So, the, um, in the process of moving from one phase to another, uh, there are certain incentives. So, if you move forward into the prison, you get more spacious compounds, there are certain consumer products, you might even get a computer, um, and you get more light. So, for Achma, this is very important that from phase one to phase four of the prison, it goes from dark to light. So the, the control of light reflects the phase of your liberation or your going backward. Uh, and the fourth phase is literally called the light. So this is Achema's uh, design of the light. This is my, uh, our uh, digital reconstruction of it. And this is maybe the most interesting part of the prison because we see a kind of uh, upper middle class living facilities, large recreational grounds, there are many shops, services available to the prisoners. Guards have entirely disappeared, so there are only invisible security cameras. Essentially, it's a kind of Truman Show-like logic in which it's no longer really clear if we're still in the prison or if we're outside the prison. Um, and I think that makes really clear the ultimate goal of, of Achema's design and also that of Wilder's Freedom Party as a whole. It's the aim to transform society itself into a prison, into a perpetual mechanism of, of control, into what uh, Gilles Deleuze calls in the length of um, Foucault's disciplinary society, the society of control. So my work on closed architecture, it translated into architectural models, a book, a full reconstruction of each of the cells of the prison model in a theater context. Uh, it was a rare one of the rare projects that became a front, new, front page news and I think it had to do with the fact that the party had just entered into government and no one really knew what to expect. So somehow Achema's model was, a, was something that showed from recent history a kind of larger plan or, or societal model that they were trying to move towards. Um, but it was also in many ways a project that was a, a wake-up call to me as something that... Um, confronted me with the limits of my own artistic practice. Like my public interventions, the work I showed before, the works on the street, or the research into this prison model, it made visible the way that the far right was reorganizing society, but becoming aware of these things doesn't really change them from happening. I, I tend to call this the WikiLeaks paradox. We can become more aware of systemic injustices in politics, economy, military, uh, industrial complex, but simply knowing about something is not the same as changing it. Like being aware or becoming aware is not unimportant, but becoming awareness in and of itself is not a force of political change, it's not a force of transformation per se. So I began to think of my work differently. Instead of um, opposing the uh, far right's turn in our parliaments, in our courts, was the point maybe not to transform these courts, to transform the parliaments in the first place. And that's what I try to address in the title of this talk, imagining organization, instead of merely 
um, which is important to research, to critique, to confront uh, systems of, of injustice or system of oppression, but simultaneously to try to build what build propositions of what alternative systems of societal organization could or uh, should be. This, by the way, is the theater reconstruction of the prison model of Agema. So the cubes you see on the floor, the exact measurements of the four cells in each of the four stages of, uh, of the prison. And then on the top, you see the kind of floor of the cell turned upwards and very slowly the light passes from morning to night. So it shows also how this, this, this control over light in each of the different phases of the um, prison model. Um, so this is the, the point where I would say that my artistic practice took an organizational turn um, to not only critique existing organizational forms, but to conceptualize alternative infrastructures and institutions. That is what I mean when I talk about organizational art. And I want to give a, a first example of this organizational art practice in a work that very much came in response to uh, the research on Agema's prison model, which is called the New World Summit. New World Summit is an artistic and political organization I founded in 2012. Um, it consists of a larger team of architects, designers, political scientists, progressive diplomats, lawyers, uh, with whom we develop alternative parliaments, like the one you see here in the Sophienzeel in, in Berlin, 2012, first parliament we ever created, alternative parliaments for stateless and blacklisted political organizations. This project was very strongly, um, was made very strongly in response to the, to the ongoing war on terror, uh, the politics of blacklisting in particular, the way that the war on terror used blacklists uh, to, um, um, to, to be able to retrieve uh, passports, freeze bank accounts, impose travel ban on organizations that it claims form a threat to um, democracy. And that fits, of course, the larger master narrative of the war on terror, that it's a, it's a, it's a fight, it's a war of us versus them, us the so-called free and enlightened democratic West, them, the, uh, the, 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 the barbaric fundamentalist Islamic East. That is, the, that is the, the, the narrative, that's the master propaganda narrative of the war on terror. Of course, researching um, the blacklists and all of the flags that you see in this structure belong to organizations that today are placed on designated lists of terrorist organizations, reveals um, a long reveals many organizations with long histories stemming from anti-colonial and liberational struggle, not organizations that by definition hate democracy in this cliche, uh, the cliche narrative of the war on terror. In many cases, organizations that exactly because of this liberational uh, anti-colonial history um, make extremely fundamental demands for wealth redistribution, colonial reparation, demands that in a way are too, demo too democratic for our current system of democracy, of liberal democracy or capitalist democracy to bear. So you could say the problem is not that they necessarily hate democracy, but that they are more democratic than democracy itself. And that makes them a threat. So what we tried to do was to create these parliaments to assemble these organizations, organizations excluded from current uh, democratic spaces of representation, and to try to narrate these alternative world histories from the perspective of the resistance, but also to create spaces, these spaces of assembly here, one of our alternative parliaments in Brussels, spaces of assembly where we could begin to recompose who or what exactly is this us in the us versus them dichotomy. Is it possible that for us citizens of, um, uh, politicized citizens of society who have protested the war, uh, that we have much more in common with those who are prosecuted in the war than with the criminal states that claim to act in our name. States that enact in forms of structural state terrorism with hundreds of thousands of, of deaths as a result in the invasions of Afghanistan, Iraq um, and Libya. So the spaces of the parliament became, um, became a place to, to recompose in, in organizationally and, and physically, and in terms of narrative, the common stories that we tell, to recompose us. 
And of course, um, the, <laughs> the, the, let's say, the artistic and architectural and design components here are very important because we took this also as a chance not only to make a political statement against the war on terror and its um, paralegal, illegal paralegal uh, practices, but also to, um, to explore the way that the structure of the parliament, the way that morphology, that form, uh, prefigures the kind of collectivity that we can achieve in a gathering. So, how can I say this best? Um, we try to explore the relationship between, between, between form and, um, and political assembly. So, for example, we, te we tested different uh, geometrical formations. Circle, tri triangle, oval. Um, how these forms influence our experience of political assembly. Like most parliaments tend to be uh, half circles or three quarter circles that relate directly to a main speaker, a main representative, a figure of power or authority. But in our parliament, um, the, at one moment, a representative might stand on the other side of the room and stand up and speak towards you. Performatively, that seems like someone is trying to convince you. That's what the spatial performative configuration uh, at that moment does. But another moment, the speaker might be sitting next to you and stand and speak forward. And at that moment, performatively, it seems someone is speaking on behalf of you. So what I'm trying to say is that the, that the, the way the, the, this, this, this visual and performative structure of a parliament really strongly influences how we relate to one another and to, to a political message, to, to a narrative that is, uh, that is being told to us. So we try to challenge that on a variety of ways. Um, to erase the use of uh, chairs, for example. We became more and more fanatically opposed to chairs because chairs, chairs are, are these very, very tragic forms, these individualizing forms. It's always like a chair can only do two things. It's empty or it's full. And when you come into a room and there are empty chairs, somehow your eyes are always pulled towards the empty chairs, not to the full chairs. So it's also a strange denial of those who are there and instead you're busy with who isn't there. Um, we became very interested in the history of the bench and the history of the bench in utopian um, uh, political uh, architectures and structures. And the bench is very curious because one person on the bench is a full bench, but 10 people on the bench is also a full bench. And the bench is a space that, that allows for democratic negotiation. You can always make more space on a bench if you are willing to make that space for another. So even before a political gathering takes place, there's already a political process of how you share space, who you are willing to share space with. So the space itself, the structure of assembly, begins to participate in the, in the political gathering. It's not just a neutral backdrop, it's something that has, has, a, has a voice, a story to tell of its own. It influences even the outcome of a political assembly. This is the only parliament, um, only permanent parliament that we ever made for the Autonomous government of Rojava, which is a, a Kurdish autonomous region in the northern part of Syria, with whom we worked for many years since the very beginning of the summit. They invited us to travel to the autonomous region. We worked with local architects and designers to create a, an, an open air parliament, a public parliament, a parliament as a public space um, that would represent a political model that, is, uh, uh, that has been built on the ground across the last years that they call stateless democracy. So democracy without the state, their, their argument is that, um, um, that, that in order to liberate the um, uh, emancipatory potential of democracy, we have to separate it from the state. And that the history of the state, particularly in the Middle East and in the Syrian region, has only been a history of forced separation um, and, uh, and violent nationalism. So for them, statelessness is not a position, it doesn't describe a position of... Uh, of victimhood or of vulnerability, but is actually a precondition for another type of democracy to, to emerge. Here's the uh, opening of the parliament in 2018. So um, th here, this is what I, I wanted to share this example with you because I hope it shows this something of what I meant, what I meant to say, describe with this organizational turn to move from the model of closed society represented by her prison model for me in this case to attempts, I'm not saying that they are su su successful, but attempts to think of infrastructure that would allow for another model of open 
radical democracy uh, to, to manifest, a counter structure to the closed society of the far right. Now from the artwork as parliament, I want to uh, move to another example, the artwork as lawsuit. And that's in a way <laughs> a moment that it, it came as a very late realization that and many years after Wilders prosecuted me in court, that I, I realized, oh, I could actually also prosecute uh, my opponents in court. Like, why am I only the one who's who's receive, who's on the other side of the of the <laughs> of the indictment, so to say? So, in um, in 2020, uh, I worked together with um, human rights lawyer Jan Vermon to launch what we call a collective action lawsuit. Uh, it's called Collectivize Facebook, uh, and it consists of an indictment against Facebook, which now is rebranded as Meta. We know it's still Facebook, so we call it Facebook. Um, uh, so we worked on an indictment against Facebook that we're going to uh, submit at the United Nations Human Rights Council in, uh, in Geneva, in which we make the claim that, that Facebook, the corporation, infringes upon the right to self-determination of peoples and individuals in various ways. So one uh, argument in our indictment is that Facebook as a corporation instrumentalizes users as, as a kind of neo-feudal data workers. So if you, um, if you are registered as a Facebook user, um, you are working for Facebook. You produce data. This data is mined by the company, is sold to third parties like advertisements, uh, like corporations, advertisement agency used for targeted advertisements. It's used to create consumer profiles that are sold on the markets. So you're working for Facebook, but you're not paid by Facebook. It's a theft of labor. It's an illegal extraction of labor time. Of course, that's only one aspect of the way that Facebook infringes on uh, fundamental rights as they are uh, articulated in the UN Charter. Um, we can think about the, the use of racist algorithms, and the use of Facebook in various surveillance uh, capacities, disproportionate impact on democratic elections through companies like Cambridge Analytica, the implication of Facebook in various genocidal com campaigns like in Myanmar, and also direct advisement, advising to authoritarian regimes, such as the uh, previous uh, government of Duterte in the Philippines, to, to name an example. So what we're saying, what Jan Vermon and me are saying in, the, in our indictment is that the very structure of ownership of Facebook is what undermines individual and collective right to self-determination. And that means that Facebook, we claim, that we propose, we demand in the indictment, that Facebook is to be recognized as a public domain, as something that has been collectively worked for, collectively created, and that its ownership has to be transferred to its three billion users. So we are unpaid data workers, we worked for it, and now we must own it. We have to socialize social, so-called social media. And that does not mean to uh, reform Facebook. We don't want to nationalize Facebook. We don't want Facebook to become uh, controlled by national governments. We think that's probably even worse than under uh, corporate control. And what we want is to turn trillion dollar companies like Facebook, in, Facebook into a kind of trans transnational cooperatives. So cooperatively owned, co cooperatively governed by their three billion user, users. A way to create a potential pathway beyond the corporation and beyond the, sta beyond the state, very much in line with this um, vision of stateless democracy that I just mentioned in relationship to uh, the work of the New World Summit. Now, of course, this, this um, collective action lawsuit is a direct response to the way that public infrastructures, public investments have been structurally extracted into trillion dollar companies. So data workers, they made Facebook, just as data workers make the Google search engine, huge source of, of data capital. But also Amazon uh, as a service, as a, as, a, as a company, it would be nothing without the publicly funded postal system, which has carried the brunt of, of its transport, let alone the fact that, that Amazon doesn't pay social security to its so-called self-employed workers, which means that in the end it's the state that pays social security for its workers. So we're funding, like we're, we are funding Amazon. Um, if you think of Monsanto, um, who has, uh, uh, that is now owned by Bayer, 
that has stolen uh, knowledge of farmers and indigenous people about seed and seed practices over decades. Like all of that knowledge existed. They patented it, they extracted it. What I mean to say is that the myth of trillion dollar companies is something that emerges from some kind of uh, CEO brilliance and vision and daring, uh, daring uh, entrepreneurism is really profoundly not true. We have paid for all of them, Apple, all of Apple technologies based on publicly funded university research, nothing that they funded themselves initially. So these companies were always ours, like they were always collective property. There is no contradiction in claiming that we want to turn them into cooperatives. That's what they should have been in the first place. So since um, 2020, uh, Jan and me, we organized various, we call it pre-trials, preliminary tribunals. We transform um, theaters and art spaces into these pre preliminary tri tribunals to introduce our indictment against Facebook, to invite publics to join our case as co-claimants, but also to invite witnesses, data activists, other lawyers to witness the future that becomes possible if we win the case. So they're not witnesses that come to reaffirm that our argumentation or uh, referred precedent is correct. We ask them, witness the future that would become possible if we would win the case against Facebook. Um, because let's say that we would win. How, what would be the decision-making structure for three billion co-owners of Facebook? Um, do we ban advertisement? Do we ensure encryption? Do we decentralize servers? Do we dismantle its infrastructure due to its uh, disproportionate environmental impact? Like what would be the social contract of, of uh, collectivized Facebook? And of course, I'm a propaganda researcher. I'm also a little bit of a propagandist. If any of you who are he hearing this argumentation um, would want to support us, on collectivize.org, you can find the full indictment against Facebook. It's also the place where you can sign so that today you would leave the room as a co-claimant in the case. So when we file at the UN, uh, we do so not as Jan Vermon and, and me. We do it with the thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands who have supported the case. It's a collective case uh, against Facebook for the collectivization uh, of Facebook. Of course, uh, to, for such efforts to succeed, it's really essential that uh, art and cultural practice is also tied to larger popular mass movements. As an artist, I'm involved with the Make Amazon Pay campaign. I developed the visual campaign identity and some of its um, uh, campaign, visual campaign strategies, mainly when it relates to public space um, interventions. Since uh, November 27, 2020, we have launched uh, the campaign together with Uni Global Union and Progressive International on Black Friday. So it's the day of this kind of like mass, um, uh, mass, uh, um, it's this typical American uh, phenomenon, Black Friday. So it's like a day where you get discounts on everything and a kind of mass buying action. And that's the day we organize co uh, collective strikes uh, of Amazon workers across the world. In 2020, um, it was uh, strikes, demonstrations, projections at Amazon warehouses in India, Bangladesh, Australia, Brazil, Mexico, in Europe, in the United States, including at uh, Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, his own mansion. So we also, it's always good to remind them that we know where they live. And, and every year on Black Friday, we relaunch the, the, the campaign um, again. So we're trying to continuously build this uh, coalition, which is complex because Amazon uh, forbids the right to unionize, which of course includes the right to unionize protests. So we try to find legal ways to, uh, to, to bypass that. The visual uh, morphology, the visual identity of the campaign, it consists of this doubling of the Amazon Icon, of course, in the normal Amazon logo, it is this very cynical smile. Um, in our case, we add the return, uh, the return arrow. So placed on the red canvas, it's, it demands the return of rights to Amazon worker, the return of their labor through a fair uh, income, social security, the right to unionize, the return of environmental costs of carbon excess by uh, Amazon, the return of profits made through tax avoidance by Amazon. So hijacking and uh, socializing the Amazon visual identity, it's an attempt, a first attempt to, to imagine its replacement. The replacement of Amazon 
uh, as uh, a collectivized Amazon owned and governed by its workers and its users in length of the collectivized Facebook campaign. The reason why I thought it was important to share this is that most of uh, my work uh, is either part of or operates in parallel to um, this type of um, uh, organized campaigns and, and social movements because I think that's the only way that artistic imagination has a, has a role to play in the political field. If it's only us isolated trying to reimagine the world without trying to link that imagination to people who are actually fighting for that world, then it's impossible to, to realize it. And then imagination can become something very toxic. Like you imagine the future, you continue to create possible worlds, but if you never realize them, then they become really toxic worlds because then it becomes an endless reminder of that what is not there instead of something that could be there. And last example that I want to share with you is um, the artwork as, from the artwork as lawsuit, that's collectivized Facebook, to the artwork as court. Um, and that relates to the court for intergenerational climate crimes. It's a long, long title. Court for intergenerational climate crimes. In short, it's the CICC, not the same as the ICC, the International Criminal Court, but of course we are aware of its close proximity. And the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes, I co-founded with a um, lawyer, academic, writer, activist, Rada de Souza. And what we try to do with, the, with our court, with the CICC, is to confront a fundamental absence in existing legal institutions. Uh, and that is the category of the future. So courts can prosecute um, the present, as in can prosecute people, states, organizations in the present based on evidence of the past, but courts cannot prosecute states, corporations, individuals in the present for the violence that is done upon unborn humans, unborn animals, unborn plants of the future. So transnational corporations think Unilever, ING, Airbus, with the complicity of states, they can store their crimes in the future. They can store their crimes in time because the future has no rights. The future doesn't exist in legislation. Ecocide, that what is the inevitable consequence of fossil capitalism, um, cannot be prosecuted because the unborn have not yet died and they are without rights in our existing uh, legal framework. So um, the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act, of which you see the first page here, that was written by um, Rale de Souza, my collaborator, it forms the legal foundation of the CICC and we call through this legal framework for a redefinition of time in the context of, um, of climate justice struggle. So past, present and future have to be radically equal. Like the future has to bear equal rights to the, to the present and the past. Ancestors, ancestors of the future, that's us, we are the ancestors of the future. And future ancestors, those who will become ancestors after us, must be recognized as fundamentally equal. And this is also the legal framework that we use, that we applied in um, the four public hearings that we organized so far, in which we brought together judges, public prosecutors, witnesses, in which we prosecuted representatives of the Dutch state, as well as Dutch registered uh, multinationals. The public acted as the jury, so they are, have the responsibility to make the final judgment based on this uh, Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act. Now to say something about the form of the court, I realize I very quickly go, tend to go into the politics of the project, but also to say something about the visual form of the court. Uh, the visual form itself consists of evidence of intergenerational climate crime. So the court is populated by images of extinct animals, extinct plants, as well as uh, ammonite fossils. That's the large fossil you see there in the center of the, of the court. And that's this one. And ammonites, for those of you who don't know, uh, were a family of uh, octopus and squid. They lived between 300 and 66 million years ago. And they per perished in the fifth mass extinction, that's 66 million years ago. And obviously, encountering an ammonite, these, these fossils, uh, these are about 100 million years old, it might seem that human life and ammonite life are pretty different in terms of our lived time and our organic composition in, well, in every possible way, I guess. But if you think about it, the ammonites are witnesses of the fifth mass extinction. We are witnesses of the sixth 
mass extinction. Um, they are fossils, but then we are fossils in the making. Um, the ammonite is also literally the fossil inside fossil fuel, which is why we place it in this pool of, uh, of refined oil in the center of the course, because when we talk about, about oil, about fossil fuels, we literally talk about fossils. We talk about millions of years of aggregated, decomposed bodies of animals, of plants, that perversely we are burned by fossil capitalism to uh, accelerate mobility in the present, to accelerate our movement, but with this acceleration of movement is also simultaneously the undoing of the possibility of a, of a, of a livable future. So placed in the center of the court, you could say this is a kind of maddening chrono-political arena, like a, an arena in which a politics of time, two politics of time confront themselves, millions of years of earth memory and their um, industrial um, uh, burning uh, at, the, at, the, at, the same, at the same time. So surrounding the center of the court, um, there are signs depicting paintings, depicting um, extinct animals placed on a radiant yellow background, each of them called comrade. And each of them is called comrade in a different, sometimes uh, near extinct language. It also shows that there is an inherent relationship between the extinction of species, animal species, plant species, and the extinction of human cultures that thrived with these species. And in between them, uh, woven banners of extinct uh, plants are present, equally termed comrade. And if you look a bit closer into the, the woven banners of the, of the plants, you can see that the, their outer shapes are kind of maintained by these banners, these little banners and, and wires. And these are traces of attempts by scientists to maintain the ghostly shape of these massacred ecosystem workers. So they, these are images that come directly from the archives, that we studied in the archives, and they have all these, these band-aids, these prothesis, in an attempt to maintain the shape of something that was that was lost. But of course, these were not just lost by accident. They are lost because the very notion of colonial discovery, and the discovery of new plants, new animals, new peoples, this so-called discovery is not a discovery. It's an erasure. The way that these plants and these animals were, were made to be known is the reason why they don't exist anymore. Like the way that they were discovered is the reason for their disappearance. Nothing was discovered. And, and that shows something of what I, I would describe it as a, a colonial death form. It, it cannot know anything. It cannot discover anything because it cannot know. It can only own. And this form of ownership, this turning of living worlds into property, um, is, that equals its death. That equals the death of these same living worlds. So honoring non-human ecosystems Non uh, honoring non-human ecosystem workers, earth workers, whether they are human or non-human in nature, this is a very important political recognition for us in the Court for Intergenerational Climate Crimes. It emphasizes interdependent struggle against a very reductive idea of rights that dominate our present uh, legal institutions. To just to give you an example, if we follow this logic of comradeship, um, as, a found, as, a, as a foundation for another paradigm of, of, uh, of climate justice. If you harm Comrade River, then you harm all comrades, animals, plants, humans, that live in interdependency with that river. It also means you harm all unborn comrades, all unborn animals, plants, humans, that would have lived with the river in the future had the, the river not been harmed now. So taking that into account, how could you ever say that rights are individual, that rights can ever be only human or only animal? The reality of our struggle as ecosystem workers, as, as earth workers, is that our collective self-determination fundamentally relies on one another. The moment that we isolate and we say that's the right of the river and that's the right of the animal or the human that lives with the river, that goes fundamentally counter to the reality of interdependency and the reality of intergenerationality thinking of those who would live with, with our fellow comrades in the, in the future. So we are comrades across the human and the non-human world because we are part of an existential struggle between our defense of living worlds, past, present and future, against the fossil capitalist death form. And lately, 
we have been extending the different uh, uh, work that we're doing with the court. We're currently pre preparing uh, cases in Seoul and in uh, Guangzhou, uh, as well as in London. But we also organize different uh, public manifestations in which we try to make the evidence of the courts uh, visible in different ways. Uh, so all of the images of um, extinct plants uh, and animals that we've shown you so far, they are all animals and plants that went ex that were made extinct, didn't went extinct, they were made extinct, from the colonial period to the present. It's evidence that climate crimes, that climate catastrophe is 500 years old. It's not 200 years old, it's not since the Industrial Revolution. The first wave of mass extinction begins with colonization. So we try to make public this evidence in various ways. This was a musical procession that we organized in, um, in Helsinki in which the names of each of the extinct non-human comrades, non-human ancestors, uh, was chanted alongside uh, fragments of the, um, the, uh, the Intergenerational Climate Crimes Act, so the legal foundation that I mentioned earlier. Um, of course, the, the form of the court is only one form uh, to assemble people and I mean we organize eight hour court sessions going uh, listening to witnesses going through evidentiary materials that doesn't speak to all people but the evidence that we make public is something that we also want to exist in a broader broader public domain which is why we also uh, think of these other public rituals and forms in which we can um, make people witness to uh, the climate crimes that we try to to prosecute but also in which we can begin to repair uh, the bonds with our uh, human and non-human ancestors and those future um, ancestors um, in the making. So I hope that all these examples have given you some uh, sense of what I meant with uh, organizational art practice uh, or the, 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 the creation of artworks in the form of organizations, how um, some of the key crises I mentioned in the beginning the rise of authoritarianism, global precarization, climate catastrophe, how they um, influence and shape uh, the propositions of these artworks. The artwork as stateless parliaments, um, as collective action lawsuits, as intergenerational uh, climate courts, not just as interventions in dominant systems, the way that they currently exist, but as a way of trying to imagining organization uh, anew. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me, and I'm really happy to have a conversation if you're up for it.